the probate court, there's probably not another court that causes more anxiety and is more misunderstood than the probate court. Hi, I'm Darren Finling of the Probate Pro, and we spend our days in the probate court addressing and litigating and administering probate and trust estates. We're gonna spend time analyzing the probate court, what it is that gets filed in the probate court, where do you file within the probate court, and how does the system work? Let's get right at it. The probate court has exclusive jurisdiction over certain types of filings. What does that mean? It means that you can only file particular types of matters within the probate court. Think of it like this. If you're involved in a criminal matter, it of course wouldn't go to bankruptcy court or the probate court. And the same would hold true for a divorce matter. You wouldn't file that in the district court. The probate court has the exclusive, it is the exclusive location for the filing of particular types of matters. Just like the name says, the probate court is the exclusive jurisdiction for the commencement of a probate estate. So this process of taking care and settling of somebody who has died, financial matters and their affairs occurs with the filing in a probate court. It's done either by filing a petition or an application at the probate court, and that begins the process. One of the most commonly misunderstood facts is that the probate court addresses matters involving a will, proving or admitting to probate the admission of the will, and matters without a will. We call that intestate. People think often that if there's a will, you avoid probate. That isn't correct. Both the admission and administration of an estate with a will, as well as without a will, occur within the probate court. The probate court has exclusive jurisdiction of all of the internal affairs relative to the administration of that probate estate. So that means if there's a dispute or an issue or somebody needs to be held accountable, it is the probate court, the judge, and maybe even a jury that has exclusive jurisdiction over those issues. Those include the estate administration. It includes the settlement and distribution of those monies within the estate. And it includes any of the declaration of rights relative to the particular interest within the estate whether it's a devisee because there's a will, an heir because there's no will, or a fiduciary. We call that person a personal representative. In addition, the probate court has the exclusive jurisdiction to address will contests. So disputes involving the construction of the will, the creation, how it was signed, whether there was undue influence, whether there was mental incapacity, duress, fraud, all of these types of issues and disputes occur within the probate court and it has the exclusive jurisdiction. As part of the probate process, you can determine the heirs. What does that mean? When somebody dies, a petitioner or applicant begins this probate process. They identify who the relatives are of the person that died. Of course, that information may be incomplete or factually wrong. So the parties have an opportunity to come forward and determine who the heirs are of the person that died. That can include even post-death paternity testing. It can include relatives coming forward to identify that they are related or those who may have been included to have been excluded. This determination of heirs is really important when there is no will. It can determine whether an estate is divided in thirds or quarters, so it can affect the ultimate distribution. In addition, the determination of heirs can be important for other factors, like applying for Social Security or other benefits. A less common matter that occurs within the probate court is a determination of death by accident or disaster. Now, this happens when somebody has been involved in a disaster, maybe an airplane has gone missing and they never found the remains, or other common disasters in which the body and a normal death certificate process has not occurred. The probate court has exclusive jurisdiction to resolve these issues and identify that somebody has died. 
probate court also has exclusive jurisdiction to handle the internal affairs relating to a trust. Now, to differentiate between a trust and a will, a will is a document that is used post-death only. A trust can involve somebody who is alive, think of a revocable living trust, as well as when they're incapacitated, and of course, after they have died. So any of the affairs relating to a trust, the probate court would resolve any disputes involving those matters. That can include, of course, the administration of that trust, the settlement and distribution, very similar to that of a will, and reformation of the trust or modification. For example, if a trust is created and it needs to be modified, and the person that created that trust, the settlor, is unable or doesn't have the authority to modify or revoke it or reform it, of course, the probate court can address those issues. The probate court also has exclusive jurisdiction to declare the rights relative to the parties and interests within the trust, as well as holding a trustee accountable for their actions. One of the most common forms of litigation is that after somebody dies and a trustee stands in the role on behalf of a trust, the trustee starts doing things contrary to Michigan law or their duties within a trust. So to hold that trustee accountable, you can bring that trust to the probate court for an adjudication of the responsibilities relative to the trustee's behavior. The probate court has the exclusive jurisdiction to appoint or remove a trustee, but that doesn't mean that you must go to probate to do so. The trust document itself may authorize the appointment of a trustee or the removal of a trustee, for example, by vote of the beneficiaries. But if it's silent within the trust or if there's a dispute, then that matter would be brought before the probate court. In addition, any fees that are being disputed within a trust, it is within the probate court's exclusive jurisdiction to resolve and adjudicate those fees. And settling accounts matters relating to the accounting of a trustee would occur also by the probate court. Often there are issues that arise in the interpretation of the trust document or about the administration of the trust. Of course, again, the probate court has exclusive jurisdiction to resolve these issues. So think about when we spoke about a will contest case, if there's a trust contest case involving incapacity, undue influence, fraud, duress, the construction of that trust, it is the probate court that would resolve and adjudicate those issues. In addition, a probate court can instruct a trustee and determine the relative rights powers and duties to the role of trustee. And if a trust has been registered with the probate court, it can release the registration. Unlike a will where if there's a probate estate, you must go through probate with a trust, it does not necessarily have to go to probate. However, the probate court has exclusive jurisdiction to resolve the disputes and to resolve issues relative to that trust administration. So most trusts in Michigan are actually administered outside of the probate court. One of the reasons that we recommend that you do extensive estate planning to, to avoid the necessity of going to probate court. Now, of course, that only means that you avoid going to probate court as long as no disputes arise. We've spent time discussing the exclusive jurisdiction of the probate court. Well, what about the territorial jurisdiction? How do you decide whether you file within a Michigan probate court or some other state? And then within Michigan, how do you decide which county to file in? We call that venue. The territorial jurisdiction is defined under Michigan statute. It identifies which state you should file in and whether Michigan is the right state for matters involving these particular issues. A resident probate estate would be filed in the state of Michigan at the probate court in the event that they were domiciled in the state of Michigan. Now notice I didn't say living. I also didn't say that they died in the state of Michigan or using the term residency. 
domicile has its own meaning. Now imagine there could be an individual that owns a house in Michigan and in Florida. There could be an individual who was traveling in Michigan and they die. So the word domicile is an important term to understand and it has a particular meaning. And if they are domiciled in the state of Michigan, then you would file and commence that probate estate in the probate court county in which they were domiciled. On the other hand, if they were domiciled in another state and there's no probate administration in that state, but they have assets in Michigan, for example, they own real estate in Michigan, you can commence an estate in Michigan. Now, in addition to further complicate this, if they have a probate estate in another state, but there's real estate in Michigan, you may need to establish what we call an ancillary probate estate. This is another probate estate. So you would have a probate estate in their domiciled state, as well as a probate estate in Michigan. And of course, as I stated, you file within the county upon domicile. Now the death certificate itself can be helpful to determine domicile, but it's not instructive always. It's a starting point. And for further analysis on how to determine domicile, let me know, I'll try to guide you. A non-resident probate is when there is property that is in the state of Michigan or property that's coming into the personal representative that is already subject to the laws of Michigan. Those matters can be filed within the Michigan probate court system in that particular county. A guardian of an adult and a guardian of a minor, as well as a conservator of an adult and a minor, all can be filed in the state of Michigan's probate court system based on that individual's residence. A guardianship involves the care and well-being of another individual, and a conservator involves their financial matters. So in Michigan, we differentiate between a guardianship and a conservatorship. They may be the same fiduciary, the same person, or they could be two different people. Sometimes there's a guardianship without a conservatorship. But either way, those can be filed within the state of Michigan based on that individual's residency. As we spoke of earlier, trust administrations can occur without court intervention. But when intervention is necessary because of a dispute or other issues relating to the trust administration require probate court involvement, the state of Michigan has jurisdiction. Now also, it's critical to understand that the trust itself may identify which state controls, which state has jurisdiction over the administration of that trust. In addition, a trust may identify which county should have jurisdiction. Most of the time when somebody dies and they have a named beneficiary on an account, think of a bank account or a life insurance policy, or if they own a bank account, for example, as joint with survivorship rights, these things generally fall outside of the probate court's involvement. But if there are disputes involving the account themselves or the named beneficiary and how that beneficiary designation was created, those matters are also within the territorial jurisdiction of Michigan's probate court. During those circumstances, when somebody has gone missing and the family needs to either have them determined to be deceased or to handle their financial affairs while they're missing, the Michigan Probate Court has territorial jurisdiction to handle the administration of those assets. We've covered Michigan's exclusive jurisdiction and territorial jurisdiction, but what we haven't answered is, what do you do if you find yourself needing to go to probate court? Well, that answer is really simple. Hire a good, skilled, competent, relatable probate practitioner. A lawyer that you feel comfortable with navigating through your particular matter. The Michigan statutes relating to probate and trust are complicated. The court rules are complicated. Having a lawyer by your side, explaining what's going on and navigating through that process will be money well spent. If you've got questions relating to a probate and trust matter, 
If you have any questions you'd like to ask of us, give us a call at 833-PROBATE or visit us at theprobatepro.com.